Well, we do that because our lawyers made us put that in so we couldn't get sued. It doesn't well, really... We still might. Like, anybody could sue anybody for anything. I don't know that I had any particular thoughts at all about the Blackberry because I was too young to really ever use one. I'd never touched one before oh, making this you. movie. Thank too you. young. I was just too young. You, you I'm, stole, I'm so young. I used that line on you in Berlin, and now you've stolen it on me. And I want you to know I noticed that exact, even the cadence of it, just he stole. Go, just go. And I thought nothing. I actually thought, I thought oh, wow, this is sort of a boring has-been product. And so... Uh, I thought it was perfect for us to make a movie in our style about, because I imagine that audiences would have the same. Blackberry for me is synonymous with, now I can be reachable at all times on email. What a nightmare. Mm. What an absolute nightmare. So I, I never had a Blackberry. I did. And when I got it, it was like 2005. And I really thought that I had arrived. That this is a movie that shows you the unvarnished version of what it's like to be broke working in a technology company trying to do something impossible. Um, and a lot of that is stolen from what we experienced making our first films. I think a lot of filmmakers watching this movie would be like, oh yeah, that's what it's like trying to make a movie. I think anybody who's any kind in, in a nascent industry trying to carve new ground is going to basically see their story in this. That's what we were going for. Well, yeah, I, I, it wouldn't have happened at all without Jim. I mean, look, maybe somebody else would have stepped in and done the done something similar, and somebody would have had to take on that role. But I don't think that the product would have been as successful as it was without the combination of the technology being so groundbreaking. But you got to have somebody out there branding it, selling it, marketing it. You know, otherwise. It, it doesn't matter how good the, the technology is. What we talked a lot about when we were writing it was that these two guys needed each other. Yeah. It was like by themselves, they both would be nobodies, but put together, you know, it's like Lennon McCartney meeting on a bus in, in Liverpool, you know, like it's like they brought out the best in each other and they complimented each other in, in a perfect way. So I think they needed Jim and nobody else could have done it quite the same way. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we always sort of thought of it as a, as a two-hander, right? Like, um, yeah, d definitely. You know, Jim certainly has his own journey and his own arc and his own wants that I th hopefully we understand when we watch the film or, or audiences do. So. Yeah, I think in an ideal world, he acts in an antagonistic manner, yet he's the pr protagonist for the product and for the success of the product. So he's both antagonist and protagonist in the film. I also think he's the person that audiences are understanding the most in a strange way, even though he's so guarded. I think that Glenn does an amazing job of doing things that, as you say, are despicable, but that hopefully the audience agrees with what he's doing every step of the way because they understand why he's doing it. That's my specialty. Well, we were lucky in that we optioned a book that the real Mike and Jim had sat down and do, done a number of interviews for. And so we had a lot of first person accounts from them, but they really didn't get into the culture or the day to day operations of what the business was like in that book in a way that was satisfying to us. And so Miller and I reached out to a number of ex employees who worked there during the 90s era and were given droves of material that we pulled from. So a lot of what you see in the film, especially during the 90s, is cribbed from diaries, especially photographic diaries that were taken by people who actually worked there. That's where we got like the clothes and a lot of the culture and how the workspace was organized and things like that. But that was not from the real Mike and Jim. I've never met them. I've never spoken to them. Well, we do that because our lawyers made us put that in so we couldn't get sued. And it doesn't well, really... We still might. Like, anybody could sue anybody for anything. No, 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 no. Sorry. What I mean is that our lawyers will have an easier time defending the picture in court. That's why we put that at the beginning of the film. But I, look, I think that's true for any biopic based on true events. Like, you know, unless it's like one of these films based on a court transcript or something like that. 
the, the writers and the filmmakers have to take certain liberties, you know. The book was written by, by business journalists, and they were very focused on that side of things, uh, and, and sorry, a, a, and a tech journalist. And, uh, and we were just interested in these people, and, and they became characters. And the further we got into it, the less we thought about, well, what actually happened? And, and you know, they just became the characters in our film. Well, what we didn't want to do was basically provide groan-worthy moments for audiences where they see the characters relishing in the time period. I think movies and television shows that do that are so hacky and, and also the opposite of timeless. Like as soon as you lean into the inherent nostalgia of an era or you bring up something that is so... It would be like if we, I don't know, had one of the needle drops of the movie be like the Macarena or something like that, you know, like something that's like, oh, do you remember this exact thing? I mean, we do have Return of the Mac. Those are not even comparable. Oh, okay. It's not too late to put Macarena in the film. Yeah, by you the know, way, we haven't. there was actually a bit of an argument to try to put Macarena as the song as you and Mike are driving to New York. For real, I had I had that conversation for real. Yeah. Um, so I think that just speaks to our taste. Like I, we, we th for some reason, the actual uh, signposts of the era. That's not why we're making the movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that 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 specific time, if you grew up when Ninja Turtles was was. Uh, getting cool and when like before the big product boom that happened sort of in the later 90s and it was still those original few pieces that that were licensed from the first season of the animated show that stuff I thought was really really interesting that first run of toys that came out again before they became very like uh, like massive big business no uh, because it, 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 by the time it, uh, they would think would have thought to do it, it would have been too late, which they did. They did try and pivot it, and it didn't it didn't work. I don't think it's a tragedy. Do you think I, I watch the end of your character and I see it actually quite triumphant, to be honest in my when I watched the film, because I haven't I only watched it last time I saw it was with Glenn. I felt like all oh, these characters kind of win in a way. Because they begin so modestly, and they got way more than their wildest dreams. I think Mike l lives a bit of a tragedy that he doesn't even understand. Mm -hmm. I think that Jay's character meets a tragic end. He essentially dies. But Jim and Doug, I, I see them as uh, really triumphant. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that because Jim Jim was a businessman and uh, you know he, he brought this company to a place where it was a multi multi billion dollar company so I think he was extraordinarily successful the product itself that he was selling I don't think he gave a shit about yeah he wouldn't care no he wouldn't care about that right so you and I said early he it, like Jim could easily be selling like very good phones sorry very good combs yeah. or like very good rugs yeah and he would have the same attitude if he saw an opportunity opportunity to to make a bunch of money on yeah a new style of comb he yeah that's he would have just gone with that so he doesn't he doesn't care about that whereas i think mike was his entire identity was tied to his you know younger self who was way ahead of the curve in terms of the technology that he was uh, playing with and trying to bring to the mass market and then to just get dusted by other people like him uh, I think it destroyed him. Uh, yeah, I well, I, and I don't again. I don't know the man. So uh, I, I don't know but I, I think that that I can see where that would be a much bigger blow to his ego and to his identity than it would be for Jim who had many other interests For me the biggest eye-opener was that and this may come off as demeaning, but I feel like the BlackBerry was a product that solved a technical problem, but had no vision. And I think the iPhone was a product with vision. And I think the iPhone, and generally what we think of as the smartphone, was a product that spoke to a world that did things differently, whereas the BlackBerry was a technical device that allowed you to be more efficient with how you communicated, specifically sending emails. Like, the, not sexy. Not sexy at all, yeah, and, yeah. And, and solving a problem that was this big, right? Like if you asked Mike Lazaridis, okay, so what does your product do? 
he would talk about it in terms that were local, right? It's going to help the manager at this company work a little bit faster. It's going to help these people manage their business in a different way. He was not thinking this is going to be a sea change in how the world communicates. And to me, that was really made clear after making this film, that there are differences between people who are technicians and engineers who solve practical problems, and then there are visionaries. And those two people are very different. They were huge sponsors of the festival. Huge. BlackBerry used to be like a, a major South by Southwest sponsor, I think as, I think as recently as like 2008 or 2009. I think they were quite, they, they used to be a major sponsor of TIFF. Huge, yeah. Yeah, huge sponsor of TIFF. So, yeah. Oh, no, I think, I think they had a lot to do with, the, with this place. Uh, people can see this and maybe mourn together or, <laughs> or not. Or celebrate. Or celebrate, you know. From the ashes of the dead, we grow our new society. 